Well, this is the second year that ASPO has decided to run a session on the intersection between fossil fuels and climate change. Um, it's, it's apparent that the, the conversation has shifted radically in this past year, especially with the IPCC report and uh, Gore getting the Nobel Prize, and that climate has moved to the forefront of the policy discussion. Peak oil has been largely ignored. So we felt that it's important as an organization that tries to give reality checks to um, interject some, uh, or to do an intervention in this debate more or less, and uh, to try to make the links between the two topics apparent and to try to do a little bit of, of myth busting on some of the general assumptions that are made by the, by the policy people. Last year, we were fortunate enough, we had an evening session and we put um, David Rutledge from Caltech, who's done a peak coal paper that you all may have seen in the same room with Pushkar Karecha, a postdoc from NASA GIS, who's lead author with uh, climate scientist Jim Hansen on a report on peak oil and fossil fuel, the implications of the peaking of one on the CO2 emissions of, of the other. We put them in the same room and it was a very successful intervention in that they have continued to talk afterwards David Rutledge has gone out to NASA GIS. He's come up to Lamont Doherty and, and started talking to the climate modelers. Um, they're now passing their, um, some of their research back and forth and quen questioning some of their fundamental assumptions internally. And just last month, in fact, Karecha and Hansen finally were published in peer-reviewed literature. Um, I guess he has a, yeah. They were rejected numerous times over the past year, but, um, but in the end, they've, they've come out in, a I think, a a biochemical journal. This represents the first, to their knowledge, the first time that a paper explicitly linking peak oil and climate change has made it into the peer-reviewed literature, which means you can now start infiltrating that into academia. And the problem with academia has been that the story's unfolding so quickly on the street that the peer-reviewed literature and the textbooks are lagging the story by a good five to, in some cases, 10 years but it's the policy debate hinges upon what's in the peer-reviewed literature. So that's a place where we're trying to, trying to uh, accomplish some interventions. This year, I wanted to thank Andy Weissman for the great lead-in to this talk. It's, uh, we're going to have three talks, one on coal to liquids, one on carbon sequestration. These are reality check sorts of talks, state of the art. And then Randy Udall will talk about what's missing from the climate debate. Um, it's, evident to us that coal will be heavily used as a transition fuel here and that the need for a substitute liquid fuel, particularly for aviation, will prompt us to, uh, to pursue coal to liquids at some stage. The technology is already there. Um, the U.S. government has indicated that they will purchase for the military any fuel that can be generated here through that process. So, and there are significant uh, climate implications to a move to CTL. So we have invited Dr. Michael Weber sitting at the end here um, to give you a talk on coal to liquids. He is the associate director of the Center for International Energy and Environmental Policy at the Cockrell School of Engineering at University of Texas, Austin. He's got a PhD from Stanford and has been specializing in energy issues, has started an energy group, has a cadre of undergraduate and graduate students who are now researching and writing on energy topics and in fact even going into the local schools and starting to bring ener energy literacy to the, um, I don't know what level they're at, the high school level and, and elementary, elementary and, and high school level. Um, so he's a, um, a generalist on all, to all topics energy, but very knowledgeable on coal to liquids. I'd like to turn this over for a brief reality check on what the state of the art of that art actually is. Wow, applause already. You know, uh, in the movies, the professors give those lectures, and it's very dramatic. And at the end of the lecture, the students applaud. Have you ever seen that? That doesn't really happen. So. <laughs> I'm very grateful. I don't know if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. Have you seen that with Harrison Ford? He's an archaeology uh, professor. And there's that really attractive female student in the front row who writes, I love you on her eyelids, and she blinks it at him slowly, and he gets all flustered. That doesn't really happen either. And, 
I was complaining to my wife that I haven't had a single female student write I love you on her eyelids. She says, well, that's because you don't look like Harrison Ford. I thought, I thought that was very rude, so I wasn't sure. But I, I'm going to talk about uh, Colts Liquids, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we talk about coal as well. I'm going to repeat some of the things you heard from David Hughes earlier today, but I think it's important for you to hear it twice. And uh, this, uh, this picture sort of summarizes some of the main points. It's a picture of coal. Look how much of it there is. Look how dirty it is, right? This is sort of part of the conflict we have. And is there really enough there for us to make a difference? And it's solid, and what does that mean? So I'm going to talk through some of the good news and some of the bad news and some of the complicated uh, picture going forward. All right, the good news. There's actually a lot of good news about coal, and people often forget this. Coal is abundant, though we can quibble about how abundant. It's domestic. It has price advantages. Uh, coal plants, I'm talking about power plants now, get continually cleaner and more efficient over time. Coal-based fuels, coal to liquids, make excellent high-quality fuels. And at the end of use, they're very clean. The, the, the fuels are really good when you make them. And the technology to make coal to liquids is actually very well known and proven over decades. And I'll go over these point by point. So you saw this earlier. Coal is an abundant resource, according to the National Academy of Sciences. USA is number one. Go USA. We're number one. And we have the largest reserves in the world, but there's a lot of sort of question about whether it's really 250 billion tons or how much. So there's a question about how much, but there's no question that compared to most countries, we have a lot. So that's good news for us. Coal is actually already a widely used domestic resource. And this is, this is the good news about coal, partly. It satisfies about a quarter of our energy needs already today and more than half of our power needs for electricity. And I put this pie chart up, which is actually from 2004, but the picture is about the same today. Coal is about 53% of our power followed by nuclear, followed by natural gas, renewables, which is mostly hydro, and now some wind. And the petroleum is a small piece. Uh, two years ago, it was 3%. Today, it's about 2%. And this is the advantage of coal, because it used to be we got 17% of our, of our power from petroleum in the 1970s. And then after all the supply cutoffs and price spikes, we made a conscious, strategic decision as a nation that we needed to get the electricity sector onto something more reliable. And coal satisfied that. So we had a big build-out in the 70s, 80s of nuclear and coal. So coal offered a real strategic advantage there for getting petroleum out of the power sector. That's good news. Coal also has price advantages. It's not only cheaper per unit of energy. This is prices in chained $2,000 economic term related to purchasing power and inflation per million BTU. And coal is generally cheaper these days than natural gas and oil. And this is uh, through 2005, so there's been a price increase recently, but not nearly as much as natural gas or petroleum. And the key here is not only is it cheaper, but it's less volatile. And if you're someone trying to build a multi-billion dollar anything, volatility is a real problem for you. And this is year-over-year -year averages, so it doesn't even show the real volatility of gas and oil, which change by the day, as we know. Coal tends to move more slowly. So it's cheaper, less volatile. And this is great from a planning perspective. Coal plants also tend to get cleaner and more efficient over time. You heard some of these numbers from David Hughes. A typical, traditional 20 to 40-year-old pulverized coal plant is something like 30 to 35 percent efficient. But modern supercritical pulverized coal plants operate at 40 to 45 percent efficiency. And if you live in a part of the world where heating districts make sense and you use heat capture, you can actually get 70 percent efficiency, which is more of an efficiency gain than the super sexy advanced natural gas combined cycle, which has 50 percent efficiency. So coal plants are getting better over time. And this is important because we do a lot of optimistic technical comparisons where the best of some future technology 40 years from now gets compared against the worst of today's technology. Have you ever seen this happen with hydrogen or biofuels or whatever? This is a typical kind of trick in the energy industry, compare the best of some non-existing technology against the worst of today's. But if you compare a more realistic assessment of future technologies compared to an optimistic assessment of today's coal, including incremental gains for coal, it actually starts to look competitive in some ways. So you heard some of these numbers earlier. And we also have modern scrubbers that deal with a lot of the environmental impacts from SOx, the sulfur oxides, or NOx, the nitrogen oxides, as well as the solids, and they're pretty effective, especially if you combine those technologies with sophisticated policy mechanisms like <clears throat> cap and trade. Then we have coal-based fuels, coal to liquids, which are of excellent quality. They have excellent performance. They burn really well, and we know how they operate, and they're especially good when you compare them to biofuels. They're especially good for aviation applications. And the things like how they burn, the temperature at which they burn becomes very important. The energy density per unit mass, per unit volume becomes very important, especially for aviation where you can't take any extra mass around. You're very weight limited. And you can't take extra volume around either. The boiling points and freezing points is often left out of the discussion, but they're very good for cold liquids, and they're not good for biofuels. If you're flying at 50,000 feet in a fighter jet, you can't have your ethanol or whatever you're operating on freeze, right? And if you have your jet sitting on the tarmac in the desert in Phoenix, you can't have it evaporate. So boiling and freezing points are an important part of the equation that biofuels often fall short on, but cold to liquids performs very well. Then because of the process for making cold to liquids, we actually extract a lot of the, the mercury and sulfur, so at end use, it burns cleaner. 
And there are already some uh, days come back from the Air Force about when you're burning with cold liquids in a jet engine, you get better cooling properties so the turbine blades actually have better maintenance, which is great. We've already flight rated 50-50 blends of synth fuels or cold liquids with petroleum-based jet fuels for B-52s and we do it more plain. So it already works. The Air Force likes it and it, that's a good sign for all of us. So the, the fuels are quite good. The technology to make cold liquids is well known has been proven over decades. Developed in the 20s, demonstrated in the 1940s by Germany because they had a blockades that kept them from getting petroleum. Deployed over the last few decades in South Africa because of embargoes. And those two points actually say it all for you. You can do cold liquids if you have to, but only if you can't get petroleum, right? You'd rather use petroleum, and this is an important point. We already today have dozens of Fisher Tropes plants installed worldwide with the capacity to produce hundreds of millions of barrels per year, mostly gases, mostly chemicals, but we can do it for liquids as well. And a lot of the chemicals are sort of like gas plants that make fertilizers, ammonia, and things like that. So we already have a lot of capacity worldwide for the processes that are relevant to cold liquids, and it gives us some confidence that it could be scaled up and that could work, at least from a technical perspective. That's the good news. There's a lot of bad news about coal. The resource information is out of date. You heard some of that this morning. Coal to liquids is expensive. Coal mining has significant land disturbance. Coal use is very carbon intensive, and that becomes very relevant to this panel. And coal to liquids is very water intensive. So let's go through this bit by bit. So you saw this earlier. The U.S. has the largest reserves in the world. We're number one. It's uh, definitely sufficient for the next 20 to 25 years. Probably sufficient for 100 years. Can't say it's uh, certain but we can't confirm the availability for the next 250 years. But there's this sort of meme out there, this thought that we have 250 years to 1,000 years of coal, and people are having trouble confirming that. And these are all from the National Academy of Study. And uh, here's a quote that, the coal reserve estimates that most people use are based upon methods that have not been reviewed or revised since their inception in 1974, and many of the input data were compiled in the early 70s. When we go back and do updated assessments, we indicate that only a small fraction are actually economically recoverable. So this implies we're going to have to downrate the reserves, probably, not uprate them. And so there's a big question after we get out past 25 years, well, what are the resources going to be? We also have coal to liquids, which are expensive. And the running joke is that coal to liquids cost is the price of oil plus 10 bucks a barrel. And as the price of oil moves up and down, coal to liquids just rides on top of that. Same joke for oil shale, by the way. It used to be a joke for tar sands, except now tar sands are being produced. So maybe the joke will end. Uh, an analogous joke is fusion, which is 50 years away and has been for 60 years, right? So this, there are other examples. And I, I've got a friend, I hesitate to say this one in mixed company, so it, it's not my joke. A friend of mine, a, a Brazilian, who's a professor at UT, says the, the third big joke beyond fusion and cold liquids is that Brazil is the next world superpower and always will be. So uh, I, uh, that's recorded, isn't it? So anyway, that, that, I'm quoting my Brazilian friend. I would never say that. There's a, it's not clear that cold liquids works without government subsidy. And it's very expensive with upfront capital costs. We're talking about a lot of steel in the ground, right? There's a, as a friend of mine says in the energy industry, sounds like a lot of kit. There's a lot of kit, a lot of pieces you got to put in there big. We do have a Sinfuels plant, Great Plains Sinfuels plant in Bula, North Dakota. You actually hear about it more in the next talk. Started a couple decades ago. Profitable for the first time in the last few years because of very high natural gas prices. So it can be profitable once you've had a couple decades of subsidies get you up and running. They take 18,000 tons of lignite to 160 million standard cubic feet of natural gas, plus 160 million standard cubic feet of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, that's EOR, plus 160 million standard cubic feet of CO2 of the atmosphere. So it's twice as carbon intensive as conventional natural gas, even when you're including the carbon into the ground. So this is very expensive and not huge scale, 160 million standard cubic feet of natural gas, not that much, and uh, it has a lot of carbon inputs, a lot of outputs, I would say. Land disturbance is a big piece of coal mining, especially if we want to double it or whatever we're talking about for doing coal to liquids. Right now, there's 4.3 million acres already under permit for mining. And this is a picture on the left of the high cost of cheap coal from an article in National Geographic a couple years ago with anecdote and anecdote after story after story of surface and mountaintop removal mining, destroying watersheds, fishing, creeks, homes, polluted water. So it's very impactful, all this land disturbance. And we have this shift nationwide over the last few decades towards more surface mining, which is the right chart, also from the National Academy study, where underground tunnel mining has stayed roughly constant, about 400 million short tons per year for decades, but surface mining has grown. Part of that is because the economics of surface mining are cost effective, if you don't have to worry about environmental impact, and part of that is a shift towards low sulfur coal. We have these requirements to emit less sulfur from coal power plants. And so the way we've accomplished that is not necessarily through better technology. It's going to low sulfur coal, which actually has low energy value too, going into the west, like Wyoming. And there, they, it's close to the surface, they do surface mining. So we're shifting towards more surface mining. That means more land disturbance. This is a huge environmental constraint, potentially, on coal to liquids. 
Here's a little cartoon I made up that I show my students, just uh, reminding people that power plants interact with the environment. This is not a cold liquids plant, but the story is kind of the same. You have fuel coming in, a third of it comes out as electricity, a third of the energy comes out in hotter cooling water, and a third of the energy goes out in hotter flue gases. So you can see already, not only do you have the land disturbance from the fuel, but you have water impacts and you have air impacts from the flue gases and from the cooling water. Now, if you had higher efficiency, like 70%, what that means is you're using some of that waste heat in a good way, you still have losses, hard to avoid the losses. If we look at coal combustion in a power plant, and I ranked the different fuels for coal, petroleum, natural gas, and nuclear, and I put the emissions here in both carbon dioxide emissions and carbon emissions. Different people speak different words. I've normalized by the mass fraction of carbon out of CO2. It's something like, a, for coal, 100 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emitted per quadrillion BTU of energy consumed. And MMT is million metric tons, a quad is quadrillion BTU. A BTU is about the energy in one match, one kitchen match. And we as a nation use 100 quadrillion BTU, or 100 quadrillion matches, which is 100 billion million matches. And uh, those quadrillion of coal emit the 100 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Petroleum is lower, 75 million metric tons. Natural gas is about half that of coal. I put nuclear about zero. This makes everybody mad. It's not exactly zero, I understand that. But uh, on a per unit basis, it's pretty good. So coal combustion is very carbon intensive, and this becomes very important for us as we care about carbon. The carbon balance of coal to liquids is at best, at best, even. And by that, I don't mean carbon neutral. I mean even with conventional petroleum. Carbon capture only makes sense for large stationary point sources like power plants or the coal to liquids plant or the gas to liquids plant. You cannot do car carbon capture, at least that we know of right now, with tailpipes. You still have coal to liquids at end use in these internal combustion engines or jet engines, so you're still emitting carbon at the tailpipe. So this is a problem. You're not, you have a carbon balance issue. You might have similar carbon emissions with coal to liquids as conventional petroleum if you do carbon capture sequestration at the coal to liquids plant. So if you go to great effort to do carbon capture sequestration at the plant, then your carbon emissions are the same as petroleum. You got it? Like it's, it's normally worse for cold liquids. And you go to great effort, it's the same. If you include a lot of efficiency improvements and the carbon capture sequestration, it might be better than petroleum, but it is not carbon neutral, right? It's not a biofuel. So it has a huge carbon balance issue. We also have a water problem. Coal power plants use a lot of water. So here's different types of cooling. Thermoelectric power plants, on average, use 21 gallons of water for cooling per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. If you have once through cooling, which is one type of cooling tower versus a, a, an evaporative cooling, you might use anywhere from one to 40 gallons of water for every kilowatt hour. Think about that, and how many kilowatt hours you use, and how many hundreds of gallons you use just for cooling your house that you don't even think about. Uh, across the na nation, this becomes a big issue. And then we start adding all these environmental scrubbers that also require some water per kilowatt hour generated. So this is, ends up being the number one water user in America, our power plants. A lot of people don't realize this. It introduces a vulnerability, because if the water's not there, you have to turn off the power plant, like we saw in the southeastern U.S. during the drought near Atlanta. The nuclear power plants there were within a few days of having to shut down. That's important for us. Coal plants have the same vulnerability. Coal to liquids also needs water. And they require about seven gallons of water for every gallon of fuel that they make, with some variation. And so water scarcity can be a limiting factor for coal to liquid plant permitting. There's a push to get a coal to liquids plant up in Montana. And last January, I actually went up for the meeting with Governor Schweitzer and talked about, we got all this coal in Montana. We want to do coal to liquids. We got an Air Force base at Malmstrom. The Air Force is going to lease us the land. We're going to do coal to liquids, and we're going to do so many thousands of barrels a day, or whatever, production. Their limit was how much water they could get from the Missouri River. Water is often a limiting factor, because in the places where you want to do coal to liquids, you also do a lot of farming. So this is worse than conventional gasoline. Conventional gasoline is about one to two and a half gallons of water per fuel produced. So coal to liquids is, I don't know, three, four times worse. It is, however, much better than irrigated biofuels. I don't know where Rob Rapier is. I enjoyed your biofuels talk earlier. The water problem with irrigated biofuels is off the charts. More than 1,000 gallons of water per gallon of fuel created. This is, this is not possible. This is not sustainable. Anyway, so from that perspective, coal to liquids looks quite good, I guess. All right, so that's the good news and the bad news. The ugly part is the confusion looking forward. Is coal to liquids going to help or hurt? It's not really clear. We have all this ambiguity around the policy. We have ambiguity around the technical possibilities and technical futures. We have infrastructure constraints, and we have the role of the U.S. Air Force pushing this. So the future of coal is hard to project. Uh, some people who are thoughtful at the National Academy said, well, it could go anywhere from a 70% increase by 2030 over 2005 or a 50% decrease. That's a big, wide margin, right? Imagine being a policy planner, an energy planner, an energy finance person, infrastructure person. You've got billions of dollars you need to invest. Everything's on hold because we can't figure out which way it's going to go. And the key uncertainties that affect these projections are whether or not we're going to have a carbon policy and what it looks like, 
whether or not we have uh, some carbon capture sequestration technologies at work, and whether or not we have the availability of affordable, scalable, reliable, sustainable alternative resources. And I think that's actually very important. If we had alternative resources today we were happy with, if we were happy with biofuels, we wouldn't even be talking about coal, right? The reason we even bother to talk about coal today is because we're not happy with the alternatives yet. They're either not affordable, they're bad for the environment, they're not scalable. There's some problem with the alternatives, and so we keep coming back to coal. And until that gets solved, we'll probably keep coal part of the conversation. So all of these affect the future of coal. The lack of clarity in energy and carbon policy becomes really important because the future of coal is highly affected by a carbon price. Carbon price affects coal more than anything else. And if we have a carbon price, it will inhibit coal use to some degree depending on the price. Energy policy can also affect it because we can have energy policy that just requires renewables. Or we could have an energy policy that just says no coal. Like we could have energy policies that affect us a lot. In fact, some of you said earlier, you can have subsidies plus mandates, right? You can combine all sorts of things. What's interesting is that carbon policy affects coal, but air quality policy actually does not. So if you have stricter requirements on emissions of NOx and SOx, that, as, that doesn't affect whether we use coal. That affects the type of coal we use. So when we cared about acid rain, we made it stricter what the SOx and NOx emissions could be. And that pushed the shift towards the low sulfur coal of, uh, in the West. That didn't mean we got off coal. It just switched the type. So air quality regulations don't change the coal picture in terms of scale, just the, the quality of the coal. But carbon policy would. And then we have all these relevant technical features that are really unclear that affect the future of coal a lot. Will carbon capture sequestration work? I don't know. Right? But if it does or not, it affects coal. Will IGCC, the integrated gasification combined cycle, work? Maybe. What's the best way to capture carbon? What if you capture it? Then what are you going to do? Are you going to put it in the ocean or you put it in aquifers or underground? You'll hear more about that next. But then what about renewable sources? Can they displace coal? Are they scalable, sustainable, affordable, reliable? We have a lot of uh, sources in Texas with wind, but it's not quite reliable, right? It's intermittent, so it's not quite displacing coal yet. It's displacing natural gas. So all these technical futures and the possible outcomes affect coal. Let me talk about carbon capture specifically. The primary challenge is with CO2 is how are you going to capture it out of a flue gas when CO2 as a molecule is about the same size and mass as other species in the flue gases. So you have some smokestack. In the post-combustion flue gas constituents are primarily CO2, which has a mass of 44 and 5 to 15% of the flue gases, and they have oxygen and nitrogen, which make up another 30 to 80%, and then you have water vapor, and they're all about the same size. So imagine all these gases flying by, and you've got to grab just the carbon. Yeah, how, do you, how do you do that, right? This is quite complicated. But this is one of the reasons why IGCC looks good, is because the stream of carbon dioxide there is in contrast to the fuel. Hydrogen is 44, a mass of 44 grams per mole instead of one. So hydrogen is much smaller. You can actually separate by mass those two much more easily. And this is why IGCC looks important, because you can do the separation more cost-effectively, incrementally, for carbon capture. Here's a picture of it. This is from Science, July 2007, where you have a pulverized coal plant. Coal comes in, you burn it, goes to a boiler, makes steam, steam goes to a turbine, makes electricity, and then you have these flue gases going to an absorber. And you can actually bubble these flue gases through like a, a solution of mono, uh, monoethanolamine, or MBA is what it's called, and the monoethanolamine preferentially binds to the CO2. So that's how you take the CO2 out. You have this solution. But when you're bubbling through a solution, you're, you're putting back pressure on the system, you hurt your efficiency. Then that absorbed solution goes to what's called the stripper, the next thing down. In the stripper, you add a lot of heat, and this is where you really get the heat. The hit because you divert about 30% of your steam to strip the CO2 off of this binding solution, and then recirculate the solution and put the CO2 in the ground or somewhere. We don't know where yet. And this absorber and this stripper are as big as power plants. They take acres. These are not small things. These are huge. And I, so there's a big hit to efficiency and a big hit to capital costs. It's very complicated and a lot of chemicals, and it's not clear if it's safe. And, but it can be done at small scale. There's a big scale question. Nobody knows. It's just like, you know, we might have a 100 kilowatt test system in 2014 or something, right? So it, like it's the, the scale is orders of magnitude smaller than it needs to be. I have a student doing analysis and research on this right now, looking at how carbon capture might affect prices in Texas. So he tells his parents he does stripper research. He's quite excited about that. But I, I assure you, it's not nearly as titillating as it sounds. So. We also have all these infrastructure capabilities that are unclear. More than two thirds of coal today is transported by railroads. And railroads are already operating at capacity. In fact, the tonnage has gone up, that's shipped every year for the last few decades, even though the railroad miles have been cut in half. In 1955, we had more than 200,000 miles of railroad. Today, we have less than 100,000. The miles have gone down, miles of track, but the tonnage has gone up. So we're already at a point where prices are going up, delivery times are slowing, and we're vulnerable to small hiccups, collisions, derailments, weather, you name it. 
small hiccups cause multi-day effects. So there's a real problem or question about whether we can get the infrastructure for railways doubled. And people are talking now about double tracking, double tracking every railroad in the nation. Think about all the railroads come through town and you have to create a second bridge. So there's a big infrastructure cost and delay, and it's not clear if they can ramp up for coal to liquids production. The railroads probably won't move the liquids, but they would move the solid fuel around probably. So then we have this forcing function where the U.S. Air Force wants domestic fuels, and they're sort of driving the conversation. Right now, they're the world's largest energy customer, so they have a big say in what goes on. They also have a philosophical problem, a deep, deep-seated philosophical problem just developed over the last few years. I, I used to do some national security studies at the RAND Corporation, you know, I go around the halls of the Pentagon talking about energy, and they said, we got this problem philosophically where we are buying fuels from other countries that we then use those fuels to intervene in those countries, and it just doesn't feel right. And I actually, it's like, but I, I applaud them for this because I think the Air Force is sharper on this than a lot of other government agencies. They say, this doesn't make sense. We're the big customer. We're tired of waiting for the rest of the government to sat together. We're going to push the issue. And they came up with the goal 50% of its fleet will be fueled by con uh, continental U.S., con U.S. sources by 2016. Half by 2016. They already use about 3 billion gallons a year of fuels. They want half of that from the U.S. This seems like it shouldn't be so hard, right? But it's hard because our fuels come from everywhere. What they have at their disposable is the ability to do long-term purchasing contracts where they can say, we want a lot of fuel for 20 years, and that gives you some of the, the incentive you need to overcome market hurdles to get loans, to feel confident that if you can produce it, you'll have a customer, and that solves all the market problems. So this is quite good. Their fuel choice, coal to liquids, because it's flight rated. They like it. They're also considering biofuels. They're looking at algae right now and cellulosic sources. In fact, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is investing $60 million of research right now for algae-based jet fuels. I'm a part of the research team for that. So there's a lot of work, but, but they recognize, you know, that's research. We, maybe it'll work someday, maybe it won't. Coal to liquids works today. So this is the Air Force's desire. Let's get some coal to liquids. But then we have this uh, EISA, Energy Independence Security Act 2007, where Henry Waxman from California inserted Section 526, basically to tell the Air Force, you can't buy coal to liquids. This is sort of a problem for the Air Force, because they have this goal to get half their fuels from something a continental. And now they have this Section 526 that says, no federal agency shall enter in a contract for procurement of an alternative or synthetic fuel, for example, coal to liquids, including a fuel produced from non-conventional petroleum sources for any mobility rate of use, like you know, aviation, other than for research or testing, unless the contract specifies that the life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production and combustion of the fuel supplied under the contract must, on an ongoing basis, be less than or equal to emissions from an equivalent conventional fuel produced from conventional petroleum sources. This is Henry Waxman saying, Air Force, you're not going to buy coal to liquids unless you can prove the carbon footprint is lower than conventional sources. This is a big deal because nobody knows what conventional is. The carbon emissions from West Texas Intermediate Light Sweet Crude is very different than the carbon emissions from Saudi Heavy Sour Crude, which is different yet again from tar sands in Canada. And we use all three of those sources for jet fuels in the Air Force. So now there's a big project to life cycle analysis, greenhouse gas emissions estimates for the Air Force to figure out, well, what's conventional? What's the benchmark? And then is coal to liquids better or worse, depending on what assumptions? So this is a huge problem for the Air Force. They try to grapple this. Is coal to liquids a solution or a problem? So this all leads up to what I sort of consider the energy problem. We have an energy problem now in the U.S. I see it as having three components. We're concerned about resource depletion. We're concerned about national security vulnerabilities from the energy trade, like enriching people who hate us or enriching people who can use that money to achieve things that are different than what we wish they would achieve. And we also have environmental limits or concerns about impacts and degradation. So we have these three components, and coal sort of sifts through this because as we try to come up with a solution, we have to balance these three priorities. We need a solution that's good for national security, which means a domestic source or a friendly source. We need a solution that's reasonably abundant, so it's good for the economy. By economy or economics, I don't really think about price. I think it's possible to have a high price and still have a strong economy. But you need enough to get some certain things done, and you want to have it in a way that is sort of compatible with an environmental standard you're comfortable with. Most options for fuels technology satisfy one or two of these three. Coal satisfies the national security side and the abundance side, at least for a while but doesn't the environmental sides, at least if we care about carbon. Um, petroleum is, has been historically good from an economic perspective, actually okay from an environmental perspective compared to coal, but bad from a national security perspective, right? So this is sort of the problem. Biofuels are, are domestic, so they're good for national security, but they're bad from an economic side and bad from an environmental side. So what solves all three? And coal ends up being the elephant in the room because it's sort of close, but not quite all the way there. And I think the question of the energy transition actually hinges more on coal than petroleum. Because if for the U.S., we have more of it than most people. What are we going to do? And role, the role of coal in this transition will be determined partly by whether we ever, 
I think your timer's wrong, because I'm not done, it's beeping. <laughs> yeah, you might want to. Actually, this is, my, this is my last slide, so I'm done. The uh, coal is confusing. Either we're going to solve the problems of coal, or we're going to find an alternative. And right now, looking forward, we don't know which one's going to happen, right? We don't have an alternative to coal right now, right, yet. We might. There are some options on the table. And we haven't fixed those problems yet. And as long as we have this ambiguity, it's the elephant in the room about what's going to happen. So I think this ambiguity for the U.S. perspective actually becomes very important to the whole conversation. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michael. Now, it's quite clear from what Michael says and what you've heard earlier this morning that Coal was going to make no sense from a policy, uh, climate perspective without the carbon sequestration. And this requirement is being written into the current policy. Um, a lot of the politicians seem to assume that carbon uh, capture and sequestration is basically ready to scale up and plug and play as soon as you set the proper price on carbon. And we've invited Pamela Tomsky to give us a reality check for what stage of R&D uh, CCS is really at. And Pam Tomsky is the managing director, managing partner of Intech Strategies based in Washington, D.C., a consulting firm that implements energy technology commercialization and carbon management strategies. So she's been working on this for over a decade and um, has served as the director of the Research Experience in Carbon Sequestration uh, Workshop Program at Los Alamos National Lab and also is the director of education outreach and regulatory compliance with the Big Sky Carbon Sequestration Partnership. She's also a member of the U.S. delegation to the International Energy Agency's CCS G8 Working Group. Would you welcome Pam Tomsky? Thank you. Um, I plan to give you a basic overview of um, CCS systems and their current status. Um, I'll highlight some of the key developments and projects worldwide and address uh, the issues that provide some of the reality checks on where we are with regard to commercial deployment. Um, first, I'll start with uh, some assumptions and a qualifier. Um, the qualifier is I'm not a geologist, um, but I've been around a lot of the scientists working in this field for a long time. Um, in terms of my assumptions, here they are. Um, now, we can agree to disagree as long as you keep your disagreements to yourself. Um, population and economic growth will drive energy demand, especially in developing countries. Fuel and coal will continue to dominate. Uh, CO2 emissions will increase substantially. Um, there's no silver bullet here. We need a, a portfolio of energy technology solutions. Um, keep in mind that the stated goal of the UNFCCC is stabilization. Uh, so any meaningful re uh, solution to the CO2 problem needs to offer some substantial CO2 reductions. And substantial, I mean on the order of a gigaton of carbon um, a year by 2050. Um, what's a gigaton of ca carbon? It's a, a billion tons. Um, the world emits about 22 gigatons annually. The U.S. share of that's about six. Uh, total U.S. coal plants are about two gigatons per year. And uh, the average coal plant uh, emits six to eight million tons of CO2, just to give you a sense of that scale. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about scale later. Um, the other assumption is that coal is going to continue to play a role and CCS is a critical enabling technology. And uh, finally, I don't think we'll see any climate change legislation this year or next, but I do think it's on the horizon, uh, or at least I did last week before the financial meltdown. Um, I want to highlight a couple of the key developments in the CCS um, uh, world. Uh, to give you a sense of the time frame, the international scientific community um, started to gather in the early 90s, uh, driven by uh, the international climate negotiations. In the mid-90s, we saw the emergence of national programs with U.S., Japan, and Norway out front. 1996 saw the launch of the first CCS um, storage project, the Sleipner project in Norway, which I'll talk about. Kyoto was adopted by the Conference of Parties in 97. And a few years later, under U.S. leadership, CCS was introduced into the International Energy Agency Working Party on Fossil Fuels. Um, I'll say that that was kind of an interesting time. Um, many of the Euro European countries were actually op opposed to CCS, but we managed to get the initiative adopted. And as the realities of meeting Kyoto target reductions um, began to dawn on many of the countries, 
Um, we pretty much got everyone on board and the governing board um, at the IEA adopted the CCS platform in 2004. Um, and finally, just this past summer, the IEA delivered recommendations to the group of eight ministers on strategies to accelerate CCS deployment. So the point I want to em emphasize that in a relatively short period of time, CCS has been elevated to the really top levels of the policy discussions with regard to climate change. Um, this slide's a little bit messy, but um, I wanted to put up all the various issues um, that need to be addressed uh, in order to achieve commercial CCS deployment. It's just not about technology or about the cost of that technology. Um, as with any new technology, there's a host of issues uh, that stand before commercial adoption. Um, I'll touch on many of these later, um, but one new acronym you may see up there is NUMBI. Uh, we all know NIMBY, not in my backyard, NUMBI, not under my backyard. Uh, 2004, we saw the uh, IPCC uh, release uh, the scientific, scientific consensus report on CCS, stating that uh, CCS can provide substantial CO2 reductions. Uh, with proper site selection and monitoring, CO storage can be safe and secure over long periods of time. And largely because it's compatible with existing infrastructure, CCS can offer a substantial cost savings on the overall costs of um, uh, stabilization. So how do we do this? Michael talked briefly about um, different capture approaches. Um, this slide shows uh, the three primary approaches post-combustion, where CO2 is re removed after the fossil fuels are burned. Um, there are many methods um, for this process, but typically it's aiming solvents. Um, Pre-combustion is associated largely with IGCC power plants, where the coal is gasified and the CO2 is removed to produce hydrogen, which can be sent through a gas turbine for electricity. Uh, water vapor is the main byproduct, and the CO2 is uh, readily available in a pretty pure form for compression and transport. Um, oxy fuel is the third approach, where um, instead of uh, air in the combustion process, oxygen is used. Um, and it also provides a very high CO2 concentration, um, but this is also, or this is in um, the early stages of development and still in demonstration. Um, I just wanted to point out um, some of the pros and cons, but each of the technology approaches uh, share some common challenges. Um, the high cost of CO2 capture is one of the largest challenges um, with regard to CCS deployment. Capture is by far the biggest component of CCS systems, ranging um, between 80 and 90 percent of the total costs. Um, there's large upfront co capital costs um, required. Um, but the real issue is the energy required to run the capture facilities, resulting in an energy penalty anywhere between 20 and 40 percent. Um, a key issue with regard to the amount of energy required is, as Michael pointed out, the CO2 concentrations in, in the f uh, flue streams. Um, some of the industrial processes have much, much higher CO2 um, content. It's easier and cheaper to remove, so that's some of the lower hanging fruit with regard to early opportunities to capture the CO2. Um, Post-combustion plants have their advantages because they do offer retrofit opportunities, um, provided that there's a large enough footprint within the facility to install um, capture technology. Um, the systems integration piece is no piece of cake um, by any means. That seems to get glossed over often in a lot of the discussion, oh, we'll just slap on some capture technology and, and run with the retrofits. Um, but there are um, many issues. Um, in addition just to the additional um, uh, power uh, required. We have no operational experience with this. Um, it presents some reliability and operations issues. Um, and the other point I want to make is that while the IGCC and the higher CO2 concentrations make it attractive for capture, we only have two IGCC power plants in operation in the United States, two. Um, we've heard a lot of buzz over the last uh, five or six years with lots of different uh, announcements for IGCC power plant builds and talk about them in association, in association with CO2 capture, but we have two. Um, on the CO2 transport, transport side, it's uh, pretty straightforward with no big showstoppers. 
um, except for the uncertainty about the size, configuration, and cost of what a, a likely interstate CO2 pipeline um, network may look like. I've heard estimates that this would require uh, a doubling of the size of the U.S. oil and gas infrastructure to get to the scale of the CO2 pipeline infrastructure that would be needed. Uh, so uh, is this reality or science fiction that we could actually build CO2, a new CO2 pipeline network, double the size of the oil and gas network, another one of these um, very large uh, hurdles and reality checks with regard to uh, uh, deployment issues? Um, and in Europe, they're looking at tankers for, to send their CO2 emissions offshore, um, looking at North Sea fields for enhanced oil recovery and some subsea um, plays. I, I heard last week at the MIT um, CCS forum that they're actually um, developing some studies to take European emissions to the Middle East for enhanced oil recovery via tanker, but I couldn't get any further information on that interesting story. Um, the next slide shows the different um, storage options. Um, by far the greatest opportunity um, in terms of volume is uh, saline formations. Um, we also have opportunities for depleted oil and gas reservoirs and deep coal seams. Um, there are a number of different um, analogs that give us some confidence in our ability to uh, store CO2 in the subsurface. Uh, of course, CO2 EOR has been ongoing for over 30 years, uh, gas storage, um, uh, acid gas uh, disposal. And there are a number of um, industrial scale CO2 um, CCS projects that offer a cumulative experience of about 20 years, um, and I'll talk about them uh, further. I just put this slide up. I think it's kind of interesting to give you a sense of um, our experience with injecting fluids into the subsurface versus the volumes of CO2 that are emitted. Um, the yellow bars show uh, emissions from Florida coal plants, U.S. coal plants, and the U.S. electricity sector. Um, the blue bars show a variety of different um, fluids that are injected. Um, you see we have large volumes of municipal wastewater in Florida, um, oil field brines, acid gas, etc. Um, and what I really wanted to emphasize here is, is just that we do have experience with large volume injections of fluids um, that are stored in the subsurface over long periods of time. Um, DOE's done a little bit of work on um, looking at the CO2 EOR and carbon storage opportunities. Um, these a couple of reports can be found on their, uh, on their website. Uh, the ARI 7 Basin Study um, in 2005, and just this past uh, February, a report was issued on storing CO2 with EOR, um, which highlights um, the following uh, few points here. Uh, DOE estimates, estimates that there's about 7,500 million tons of anthropogenic CO2 um, that could be used as a value-added um, uh, benefit for enhanced oil recovery and carbon storage. Um, that CO2 EOR does offer a clearer path to storage because it does bypass some of the spore, spore, um, pore space and liability issues associated with a dedicated storage site. Um, they also have uh, um, put in a little controversial uh, accounting here that uh, there's the potential for more quote, green oil, because when you do a full accounting of the CO2 storage um, and the CO2 of the produced barrel of out, um, oil, you have about a 70 percent carbon-free um, uh, barrel of oil. Um, of course, it uh, does allow for increased domestic oil production, and um, the EU ETS, um, the Clean Development Mechanism, and others are looking very closely at opportunities to include geologic storage and storage with uh, in depleted oil reservoirs um, and carbon credits. That's been ongoing for a couple years. It's pretty controversial because it's thought that any inclusion of geologic storage or CO2 EOR will uh, flood the current uh, carbon storage or carbon credit market. Um, this next slide shows the different um, trapping mechanisms. Um, uh, for CO2, it's injected at certain depths to maintain a supercritical um, 
condition. There's primary um, trap and uh, the CO2 would be injected beneath a low permeability um, uh, cap rock or seal. It's often a, a sh shale or a clay. Um, there are secondary trapping mechanisms where the CO2 dissolves in water. It's trapped by capillary forces and over time it converts to solid minerals. Um, these are natural processes that take place in, in reservoirs and that over time these reaction rates um, increase um, offering a more stable um, uh, storage environment. Um, number of technologies um, commercially available and being developed to monitor CO2 both in the subsurface and surface um, and I've listed some of the, those here. Um, and these technologies are um, instrumented to uh, ensure that there's a monitoring of any potential leaks, potential, particularly into uh, uh, groundwater or any leaks into the atmosphere. Um, uh, and it's important to differentiate, too, between uh, uh, leaks that are, are smaller leaks and then larger releases. And the larger releases are the higher risk but lower probability. Um, this just puts CCS into a systems context. You obviously need to uh, make sure that the, there's a proximity of sources to storage sites with adequate um, uh, enabling infrastructure. I've mentioned that um, some of the lower hanging fruit for CO2 capture capture opportunities will be gas processing and in industrial facilities, um, and in terms of storage, it'll be CO2 EOR and enhanced bed coal me bed methane plays. Um, so I wanted to put this slide up to give you a sense of just the number of different CCS projects that are underway uh, worldwide. Uh, it indicates um, uh, enhanced coal bed methane. Some of them are depleted oil fields, et cetera. A lot of them in North America, but they're pretty well dispersed throughout the world. Um, some of the key projects, I've mentioned the Sleipner project in Norway. It was the very first CCS project initiated in 1996. The natural gas produced from the North, North Sea has a high CO2 content that is required to be stripped out. Um, it's about 12 percent, and in order to meet pipeline specs, it needs to get down to about 2 percent. So Statoil opted to strip the CO2 and inject it into a subsea reservoir instead of being hit with the uh, carbon tax that Norway implemented. So about a million tons a year have been um, um, injected into uh, the subsea reservoir, and Norway just also recently launched a second CCS project, also in conjunction with natural gas processing. It's a fully subsea um, operation. Um, the pipeline's about 143 kilometers where the natural gas is piped on shore for LNG processing. The CO2 is sent back um, through the pipeline and injected um, beneath the seabed at a rate of about 700,000 um, uh, tons per year. Um, another uh, well-known, excuse me, CCS project is the Insala project in, in, in Algeria. Um, again, about a million tons of CO2 a year. There's absolutely no commercial benefit uh, to this project. It's uh, um, entirely used as a test bed for CO2 monitoring. Um, the incremental cost for the CCS um, program have been about $100 million. Um, but a lot of uh, good information about CO2 storage and, um, again, testing various monitoring technologies. Um, we've heard about the Weyburn project. It is the world's uh, tip, uh, largest uh, storage project. Um, in total, through the lifetime of the project, about 30 million tons of CO2 will be stored. Uh, the CO2 is piped from Dakota Gasification uh, uh, Synfuels plant. Um, where all the um, commercially available CO2 is recovered and, and sent up north. It's been one of the more profitable uh, elements of that operation. There's a pretty rigorous CO2 monitoring uh, program, and in this current phase, um, that monitoring program is, is linked um, very well in with some of the regulatory framework development. Um, in the United States, um, the large activity um, here on the storage side is the DOE regional partnerships. They were launched in 2003. There are seven throughout the United States. Um, uh, they've conducted an assessment of the different geologic uh, storage opportunities and, and where the opportunities to capture um, CO2 um, exist in each region. There are currently 25 geologic field demonstration test sites um, indicated in the uh, yellow sun stars. Um, 
many of these uh, are just smaller scale, in fact, where some of the CO2 is purchased and, and trucked in um, uh, to the storage site, uh, test site. Um, it's been uh, a pretty expensive proposition to buy and truck the CO2 into these field tests, but coming into the third phase where there will be um, some larger scale on the order of a million tons plus per year, um, a couple of the projects have been linked with anthropogenic sources of CO2. Um, I just put up a little note here that uh, future, ben, future Gen would have been and, and perhaps one day will be in Illinois. It was to be the world's first large-scale integrated CCS uh, demo using IGCC technology. It was on course to be in operation by uh, 2012. It would have been the world's first and unfortunately it was canceled and is currently undergoing a restructuring at DOE. So I want to uh, turn to a, a few of the reality checks. Um, the first one here, and I've talked a little bit about it, that, is uh, scale. Um, if we're really going to do this, um, we've got to do it in the context of climate change mitigation. And I've mentioned that one gigaton of carbon a year to make a meaningful difference. Well, what does that mean? Um, a gigaton is also doubling the fuel efficiency of the world's entire car fleet. Um, it's fuel switching. Uh, we can switch 1,400 uh, coal plants to natural gas plants. Uh, nuclear, we can triple the world's nuclear capacity to achieve a gigaton reduction. Uh, we can include CCS on 800 coal plants, uh, which would be equal also to 3,500 Sleipner projects, that first Norwegian project injecting a million tons a year. Um, so these are the options that we have to achieve a gigaton reduction, and that's what you should really be thinking about when, when you think about CO2. It really is uh, CCS. It really isn't within the context of this portfolio of solutions. Hard to do, yes. Uh, can we do it? Uh, yes, but not without uh, pain. I know everyone's pretty excited and interested to hear about costs. I mentioned I was just at the MIT forum where um, they've come out with a, a coal report that's been quoted a lot, um, and the MIT folks are saying, trust no cost estimates. We don't even trust our own. So um, I hope you don't uh, pin me down too much on the cost, but I, I want to just note that they, the costs do vary significantly on location, technology, fuel type. Um, we've just seen this incredible escalation of uh, commodity and materials costs. Um, and in terms of the study, different methodologies and assumptions are, are used for each study. And it's important to note that we haven't built one of these yet, so we don't really know uh, what the true costs are going to be. But we know that it will increase the costs um, either on a per ton of CO2 basis or the cost of um, electricity increases. Um, and on average, we're looking at, um, you know, roughly uh, 40 to 80 percent uh, cost of electri electricity increases depending on what type of configuration you have and fuel type. Again, there's just incredible amount of variation here, but again, um, a substantial increase in the overall uh, cost of electricity. Um, there are also some other issues, as I pointed out in, in my earlier slides. Um, we have a lot of mixed views of CCS. It's largely unknown to the public. Um, NGO opinion is by no means uniform. Um, Greenpeace recently came out with a new report on uh, uh, carbon capture and storage called False Hope. It's quite critical, uh, and Greenpeace, as always, has been quite vocal in opposition to CS, CS, CCS. But on the other hand, there are some NGOs that have take a, taken a lead and are real advocates, the Natural Resources Defense Council here in the United States in particular, um, Bologna out of Norway, and a number of Canadian groups. Um, but again, uh, the views are quite mixed. Uh, regu the regulatory framework, the, there's no current existing regulatory framework for large-scale um, uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, states are addressing the issue um, in, in their state legislatures. Probably the most um, advanced has been Wyoming taking a look at this. Um, the IOGCC has been involved for a number of years, issuing a couple of different reports on um, their experiences with working with the oil and gas industry and uh, how that those frameworks could be applied to carbon capture and storage. 
Um, the World Resources Institute has been very engaged in their stakeholder process to try to develop uh, recommendations and really provide input into the EPA process. Um, just this past July, EPA issued their um, draft guidance on uh, CCS. Um, a number of public hearings will be taking place, and, and the, uh, the um, guidance is currently open for public comment. Human capital is another real issue. The energy industry is uh, facing severe human capital shortages, even without this massive CCS um, deployment needs. Um, we see that everywhere in every aspect of, of the energy business. Um, but we do have a couple of programs, one that I run on um, carbon capture and storage um, focused at the graduate and PhD level. So we are trying to make this field a much more sexy endeavor for young people to go into. Um, a number of policy developments that are pushing and pulling um, deployment of CCS. Here are some of them. I, I'll just uh, also add that there's a number of uh, um, uh, legislative um, proposals um, requiring that coal have the same emissions profile as natural gas combined cycles, so that's driving CCS in many states as well. And it doesn't really matter what we do here in the U.S. because China and India are going to continue their um, uh, coal growth. Um, we've heard a lot of that uh, uh, here I won't go into it, and along with the coal growth, of course, we're going to see a tremendous increase in the CO2 emissions. So if we're really going to get serious and do anything about the CO2 issue, I I'd like to think about it in terms of Maslow's pyramid in that uh, we're really only going to address this uh, climate change issue once the lower order of, of our needs are met. Um, are there similar patterns with regard to energy and climate change? Uh, once we secure our basic uh, energy needs, then can we focus on um, the climate issue? Uh, will India and China, or when will India and China focus on that? And, you know, in my mind, uh, will the U.S., after we're looking at some of these financial crises and some of the more immediate issues that uh, we're facing with regard to peak oil and, and other other issues in, in our energy um, system. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you and stay on time. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Our next speaker is going to pull it all together to interject the peak oil and possibly peak coal part into this discussion. I, can, I think you can see that we're looking at a real gap between where policymakers, where we need to be and where we actually are. Uh, we'll read one comment, which I'm sure Randy will address somewhere within his talk. I feel like addressing carbon dioxide and climate change is a little, is a little like taking Advil to uh, uh, cure a brain hemorrhage. Am I wrong? In light of peak oil, if carbon dioxide has an atmospheric lifespan of 100 years and we're on pace to use all or about 90 percent of our fossil fuels in about 200 years, then any real climate plan must think on century timescales. Is there any point to current climate legislation? And does peak oil and peak coal solve the problem of cutting CO2 emission by 5 percent by the year 2050? I'm going to turn this over to Randy Udall, who you know through the peak oil world, but who has spent many years doing in the solar industry and um, also has done a lot of work on renewable energy mitigation uh, credits, followed the climate debate for a long, long time. Randy Udall. So C CCS is kind of CPR for the coal industry, it seems to me. I mean, the only reason we're talking about it is because we think, Dwight, maybe you should come help me here, that we have we have a staggering amount of coal, which, which, is, which is the belief, the common belief. Um, I, wrote, I wrote my first article on climate change uh, some 20 years ago uh, for Sierra Magazine. So it's an issue I've been thinking about for a long time. I know some of you in the room may not believe in anthropogenic uh, global warming, that human beings are having anything to do with it. But I do. I think the science is settled on that. Uh, but I've also learned that you can't convince somebody if they feel differently. So I'm not going to try uh, to make that case. One of my favorite writers is a guy named Lorne Isley. Uh, he wrote that man's long adventure with knowledge has been to climb up the heat ladder uh, 
The creature that crept furred through the glitter of blue glacial nights now lives surrounded by the hiss of steam and the roar of engines, and he is himself a flame, a great roaring furnace. This morning, four million Chinese walked underground. Most of the coal mining in China, 90% of it is underground mining. Um, we have 140,000 troops on the ground in Iraq. They have a force 30 times larger mining coal in China. A hundred of these men will die this week. It sometimes occurs to me, are, are we changing the climate? or are we waging war on it? Um, this is a plot of 300 years of, uh, 250 years of global carbon emissions. The orange at the bottom is deforestation. Uh, and the purple plume that grows dramatically after World War II, that is the global fossil fuel burn. It's interesting, you can look at this as exhaust, as smoke, or you can look at this image as fire. And David Hughes was the first one that pointed out to me that if you think of it as fire or smoke, half of the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere and half of all the fossil fuels we burned as a species has, have been consumed since 1980. Our moment in human history, I would argue, is the big bonfire. You can think of our predicament or our situation as six billion humans around an enormous flame. We're piling on about a million tons of fossil fuels every hour, uh, producing, when you burn those fuels, uh, you're producing about 80 million tons of CO2 a day, some of it will still be there 100 years, a portion of it will still be there 500 years from now. Now, the problem is that we're getting, well, there's six billion of us, okay? So two billion are up close to the fire. They're consuming their body weight like we Americans are in petroleum each week. They're living the high life, they're partying, they're dancing, kind of like some of you were doing last night. Um, and then on the outer ring, a long way away from the fire, you have two billion people still cooking on animal dung, making a dollar or two a day, aspiring to move closer to that fire, to have a share of it themselves. And all of these six billion people are getting very conflicting information right now in terms of how much available fuel there is. Um, and so I'm curious, are we taking the smoke for granted and the fire as a given. This is an EIA plot. It's a plot of projected uh, supply. All the EIA graphs work great if you just change supply to demand. Um, this actually, I think, is a very realistic uh, diagram of the soaring global appetite for fuel. I have no doubt that the demand for fuel is going to soar just as it's exemplified here. And the EIA simply assumes in their energy model that demands for fuel will be met by supply. But in the peak oil community, we're beginning to wonder whether the new future isn't a future in which it's a case of demand meets supply. The latter constricting the former. Now, the EIA, um, what's important about this worldview is it's shared not just by the EIA, but also by the IEE, IEA in Paris, until very recently, uh, the IPCC, the, the 2000 scientists that study climate change, the USGS. This is the conventional worldview. This worldview is also shared by most environmental groups, by Al Gore, by Amory Lovins. This is the cornucopian worldview. Um, and in this worldview, fossil fuels are not only very abundant for the next two or three decades, indeed, throughout this century, they're cheap. So in the EIA's uh, high price world, by 2030, oil rises 
or I guess it falls to $100 a barrel. And, and in the reference case, what is that, 59 or something, they, they bump this up a little bit so that they don't totally embarrass themselves. Um, last spring, when, when, when um, in my town in Carbondale, gasoline was $4, diesel was five, um, I, I sent an email to my brother Brad, I said, and he works in the climate arena on water, I said, Brad, there is enormous skepticism of IPCC energy modeling among the peak oil community. Uh, we find your energy models and your stress scenarios for the next century, we find them absurd. And he, he uh, the danger with email, of course, is it can be forwarded. Um, uh, so Brad, Brad forwarded my email on to a leading climate modeler at one of the federal labs, and he wrote back, and he, he, he copied me on this. He said, we are all extraordinarily skeptical of the peak oil stuff. We know of no reliable information that suggests we're going to be running significantly short of any fossil fuel in this century. It certainly won't ho happen with any significant price on carbon. This next paragraph blew my mind. We've done a few 300-year scenarios that have some shortages in them. But even that may not be realistic. This is especially so with coal. The Chinese say they have enough coal for centuries. The idea that we're only going to reach 450 parts per million atmospheric concentrations of CO2 is not defensible. Do you really think there is only another 60 years of fossil fuel left? And then the little ridicule tagline, I don't think so. Um, now this kind of blew my, blew my mind because I'd heard Jeremy speak and I'd heard Peter Wells speak and I, I think the evidence for a near-term peak in, in, in oil production is really convincing now within the next decade at the, at the most. I mean, you've seen that throughout the conference. Um, a few weeks later, Roger Bezdick sent me another uh, paper that he had written. He was a co-author of the Hirsch Report, the famous Hirsch Report, and Roger's new paper uh, which I don't know that I believe this either, but he said that in his new scenarios, they have the total world fossil fuels production will peak in 2017, nine years from now. Now the gulf between this, where we have no fossil fuel constraints for three centuries and where we're facing a peak in the global burn, in the bonfire within a decade, the gulf here just blows your mind. I mean, it's staggering, the gap between these two worldviews. And uh, I, I struggled with it. You, you know, you just can't, you can't contain in one human form two paradigms that are so diametrically opposed. So let's examine them a little bit. What are the climate change modelers missing? What's hiding in the grass? Um, this, this, is, this is the worldview of the IPCC and of the USGS and of the EIA. Uh, each area here represents their best estimate of the amount of carbon in the world, how, how much fuel we can throw on the fire. So the small boxes on the right side of this are the carbon contained in conventional gas and oil, the big blue box on the bottom left. 10 times more carbon in the world's coals, they would argue. And then they have the unconventional fossil fuels as represented by the black square, the entire black square here, which is another staggering. Th these are things like uh, methane hydrates, but also tar sands, oil shales, all those things that we've talked about. Um, so this is, this is their fundamental uh, perception is that plentiful fossil fuels mean that the problem will not go away on its own. Now, I should stress that most of the 2,000 scientists working on the climate change scenarios know absolutely nothing about energy. 
they are primarily, they know, they're experts and they have PhDs in albedo, uh, the reflectivity of ice, uh, storage of carbon in soils, uh, aerosols, clouds, ocean dynamics. But they take all of their energy information from a small group of a few dozen scientists at the IPCC that proclaim themselves to be expert in energy. But this is, the, this, this is a visual paradigm that underlies, every time you see a statement that we need to reduce emissions by so much by 2050, this is what's underlying it. Now, when you get into their books and you begin reading them, it's important to recognize that they've entirely excluded from the very beginning, twilight in the desert or road warrior-like futures. This, our scenarios, they say, are intended to exclude at catastrophic futures that involve large-scale environmental or economic collapses. In such scenarios, greenhouse gas emissions might be low because of negative economic growth, but nobody would give a damn. Uh, hence, this report does not analyze such futures. Now, here are the nested assumptions in all the IPCC and climate studies you'll ever read and at the EIA. Energy scarcity is a myth. Yes, energy resources are concentrated in a few countries, but the idea that there's a scarcity of them at a global level uh, is simply false. The fuels are not just abundant, they're super abundant. There's no reason to hoard them or fight over them. There's no reason for resource nationalism. They will always be globally traded from haves, energy haves, to energy have-nots. You can use coal as a backstop. You can turn coal into anything you might ever want, chemicals, liquids, or gases. And fuel, therefore, for all of these reasons, will remain cheap for a century. So essentially what the IPCC is saying to the people at the back of the bonfire and to the people very close to the bonfire in NASA speak, they're saying you are go for launch. We've had an exponential century, but there's plenty of fuel to have another one. Um, this is the cockpit of the space shuttle. There are two seats in here. You can fly it from either seat. So, it disturbs me because if you're flying it from the left seat and you're concerned about carbon constraints, your initial operating conditions, what those gauges are telling you, are totally different than if you're flying it from the right seat. So let's put some pilots in here. Uh, in the left seat, let's put Al Gore. Um, so he's getting the signal that, uh, on his gauges, he's getting the signal that uh, fossil fuels are enormously abundant but that climate change is the critical problem facing humanity. In the right seat, we could put T. Boone Pickens or any number of people, but let's put Charlie Maxwell there. He had an interview in Barron's uh, two weeks ago uh, forecasting that he saw oil. This blew me away because Charlie's a very courtly patrician guy, spoken at our conferences. He's not an alarmist. He's been analyzing the petroleum industry for four decades. He said that oil would be $300 a barrel by 2015. And now this blows me away because I don't think, it's hard for me to imagine the American economy surviving at that level, but perhaps. So let's put Charlie in the right-hand seat. Now, it's conventional wisdom that, well, yeah, if you do kind of the right things on climate change, you'll do good things on oil or vice versa. These are the flip side of the same coin you know, good energy policy will address them both simultaneously. I'm going to make a counterintuitive argument that our obsession with climate change is dangerous. It's dangerous because it's, dis it's distracting us from the more immediate peril that we're in. Ten years ago, Egypt 990 left New York. There were four pilots on board. It was a long flight. Uh, two of the pilots were going to replace the others halfway along. Uh, the lead pilot, about an hour out of New York City, uh, went to the bathroom, and one of the replacement pilots came into the cockpit and locked the door. He was the only pilot in there. He turned off the autopilot. He had been severely reprimanded by his supervisor that morning. He turned off the autopilot. There were 200 million people on board. Uh, 200 people on board. <laughs> I, I, I know you guys. I know you guys are doom gluttons. So I'm trying to satisfy every doom appetite you might ever have. 
He put the nose down. He reduced the thrust on the engines. And in the next 30 seconds, the plane plunged 15,000 feet. Now, Jeremy, you have to fly back across the ocean, so you might not want to listen to the rest of this. Um, the other pilot that had gone to the bathroom forced his way into the cabin. He said, what the hell are you doing? And you had these two pilots there. The other pilot came in. He started pulling the nose up, pulling the nose up, pleading to the guy in the right-hand seat, saying, pull with me, pull with me, pull with me. And the other guy was pushing the nose down, pushing the nose down. And they were working in such strong opposition to each other that at this point in the graph, after about 30 seconds, the uh, surface at the rear of the plane that controls the pitch, the attitude of the nose, each control is linked to a portion of it. They split it because they were working so hard. But the guy trying to pull the nose up succeeded and the plane soared back up to 24,000 feet. At that point, the suicidal pilot cut the engines. An engine fell off the wing because of the G-forces, and the rest of the story you can imagine. Now, that's melodramatic, I would argue, uh, a bit. Um, uh, but I am concerned now that, that this is kind of the situation we've got ourselves into. Gore's objective is to protect posterity. His flight plan says we're headed to 550 parts per million by 2100. This would commit us to three degrees of warming Celsius and eventual over a few cent, uh, centuries, 20 to 80 foot sea rise. And then, you know, basically global emissions must peak by 2025 and fall 80%. Now remember, this is all based on the idea that we have enormous reserves of fuel. So the first step is to put a price on carbon, maybe $20 a ton. And the goal is to stop sea level rise, otherwise Florida is inevitably going to look like this maybe two or three centuries out. And we should save New Orleans. This photograph was taken after Katrina uh, on the president's first visit there. Um, <laughs> Uh, we don't want to create, inadvertently create, dozens of new uh, cities that are below sea level, so sea level rise then is the dangerous anthropo uh, anthropogenic interference with the climate that we're trying to avoid. Uh, it follows from this abundant worldview that you're going to have to either store uh, gigatons of carbon under the ground or you're going to have to scrub it out of the atmosphere. There's a guy at Sally's shop called Lackner. Uh, that proposes building these enormous machines to actually scrub the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Um, you're going to have to build 800 coal plants with carbon sequestration. You're going to have to look at Sokolow, uh, Sokolow's wedge diagram and figure out what you want to do there. But let's go back and look at, the, look at this situation from the view of the guy on the right side of the cockpit. Charlie Maxwell's flight plan is much simpler, and uh, his goal is much simpler. And his goal is much more bipartisan, I would argue, certainly in this country. His goal is to preserve prosperity. Energy is the original currency, he would argue. We need to save it, conserve it, use it with utmost efficiency. Charlie doesn't think you need a $20 a ton uh, carbon price because a $300 barrel oil price is the equivalent of a $500 a ton carbon price uh, going to oil exporters. In Charlie's view, if oil exports are peaking, then we are facing the most serious crisis in the history of manned spaceflight. Uh, China is effectively challenger. China is trying to take off with 1.3 billion people on board. They're trying to achieve middle class prosperity. The U.S., on the other hand, is effectively Colombia. We're trying to find a prosperous way down, if you believe in Charlie's worldview. Okay, we've got 300 million people consuming their body weight in petroleum every week, uh, driving the distance to the moon every 20 years, each one of them, the oil tribe. You're trying to put them on the ground in one piece. What we really need is some communication across these two seats, back and forth. And this is a photograph of Jim Hansen, a very prominent climatologist. This guy's a hero of mine. He writes these beautiful kind of poetic letters that he circulates privately. Some people would say he's now obsessed with climate change, but he's enormously analytical. 
and he's got a heart as big as this room. He cares about his kids, and more importantly, he cares about your kids and your grandchildren. So how big is our carbon budget? Hansen would argue these are 300-year emission paths. Think of carbon emissions as a long journey. We have to pick a path to get on. Hansen would like to actually get on the lower path here, the 350 part per million path. But to get there, you would have to do a U-turn because we passed 350 parts per million about 25 years ago. That's an off-ramp on the emission highway we've already gone, gone past. The red line here shooting up, that's the EIA's vision. Uh, Hansen would settle for us being able to do 450 parts per million. So what does that entail? What does solving the climate problem really entail? This is your carbon budget. This is the amount of fuel you can burn over the next three centuries if you want to stay below two degrees Celsius or about four degrees Fahrenheit global average. Now, the difficulty in climate policy is you have to divide this fuel, this carbon budget, between countries and even more difficult and ethically problematic, you have to divide it between generations. Very difficult thing to do, but fuel consumption, the fuel burn, global fuel burn, essentially has to approach uh, two or three uh, billion tons of carbon over the next 300 years and then stay that low forever. If you're willing to tolerate a world that's a little bit warmer and you don't care about the future of New Orleans or Miami, then you can burn more fuel. And so you have a somewhat bigger carbon budget, you still have to divide it. The ethical and moral and diplomatic and political challenges here are enormous, and this is the stalemate. This is why, in my view, uh, climate change, a successful international resolution, is really difficult, perhaps impossible. In Bezdek's presentation that he sent me, uh, he says, we're, this is the one in which global fuel burn peaks by 2017. He achieves that result by suggesting that oil's going to peak uh, by 2015, but then go down quite steeply. Oil's the green line here. Coal would continue to rise over the next 40 years, but rise much more slowly than the EIA thinks it would. And then natural gas would peak about 2030. Hansen's also done some scenarios. Um, this is one of, of Jim's scenarios in which you still stay at about 450. Again, he has oil and gas, oil blue here, gas green, peaking pretty soon, early in this century, 2015, 2020. And then he has the coal burn peaking around 2050 at a quite low level, at a level almost where the Chinese are using essentially all of Hansen's coal budget. If you heard Friedley speak yesterday, in this scenario, the Chinese would be using almost all of the world's coal budget. So this is the, this is which worldview do you believe in? Which one of these uh, paradigms is correct? Uh, man, the, Chinese, the China presentation yesterday was very sobering for me. There are coal fires that have been burning in China since the Pleistocene for tens of thousands of years. There's lots of coal in China. And uh, I have a friend that consults over there. He says every coal mine he visits, their five-year production plan is to double production. This is another one of Hansen's scenarios. Again, the right-hand one keeps us at 450, but you have to begin phasing coal out globally at 2025 in this scenario, phasing it out globally. Um, so it's not just China that has a lot of coal. Michael made this point. You know, a Wyoming politician uh, said a few, um, uh, a few decades ago that Wyoming boasts enough coal to weld every tie that binds, drive every wheel, change the North Pole into a tropical region, or smelt all hell. When you, when you think of the coal being mined today in China and Wyoming, just today in the next 24 hours, the easiest way to visualize it um, is as a train load full of coal, 800 miles long. Uh, there's one leaving today, and there's one leaving tomorrow. Now, Hansen, uh, in a moment, in an intemperate moment, compared these coal trains to Nazi death trains. Uh, he was reprimanded, but, but that's, that's uh, you know, that, that's how central coal is to the energy dilemma, the sustainability dilemma. David Hughes made some of these same points earlier today. Um, I'm going to skip these two slides. Actually, you know, the reason we have trouble with both of these issues in America, I think, is our frontier mentality. Uh, 
I was on this drilling rig. It had a great bumper sticker, Earth first, we'll drill the other planets later. Um, I, I actually think that peak oil is going to make the resolution of the climate problem, person, this is where I ended up, uh, it's going to make the resolution of the climate problem much easier. Uh, I think that peak oil uh, is, is really a gift in many respects to the human species. That hasn't been the prevailing view expressed here at this conference. but. Um, let me end just with two slides. A long time ago, I used to work as a boatman in the Grand Canyon. It's 225 miles. There are 30 big rapids. And, and you can lie there at night early in the trip. And the, the biggest rapids, a few of them are way downstream, the scary ones. Lava Falls. There's another one called Dubendorf, an upset. You can kind of have nightmares about what might happen to you downstream. But you quickly learn that there are a lot of rapids between those really scary ones. Uh, which might, in this analogy, represent climate change. There are a lot of rapids between you and them, and you have to run the immediate rapids first, the nearest ones first, and it's quite clear, I think, to all of us, that if you've been here the last two days, that we're in a big water free ride right now. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I'm sorry we got started a little bit late on this session and we will only be able to take a very few questions. We had a tome of questions delivered and I would like to urge you to take it, especially the technical questions to our subject matter experts where you can corner them in the halls because we will have to, uh, to clear to set up the tables here. Um, question for either Michael or Pamela. Most CCS schemes are actually advanced or enhanced oil recovery schemes, how much CO2 is actually saved when oil is produced with these? Is this, is this live? So the, there's a, an economic incentive to start the carbon capture sequestration with enhanced oil recovery, primarily because the infrastructure is in place, the pipelines exist. And this is a big deal in Texas, especially West Texas. Texas has been sequestering carbon for a few decades for enhanced oil recovery. In the end, you still emit the carbon from the oil that's produced from underground. So it, it doesn't help you from a carbon balance perspective so much. What it helps you with is gaining some expertise, and that's sort of the excuse. The oil fields that are appropriate for enhanced oil recovery aren't large enough to handle all the carbon anyway. So it, enhanced oil recovery is a way to practice and get the pipelines and pumps and compression and everything else in place. In Texas, we actually have a new law in the books that incentivizes carbon capture and sequestration, which is sort of interesting. We have taxes, we collect taxes on oil production. It's a mineral that belongs to the state, is the state's view, so if you produce it, you owe the state a certain percentage. The consequence of that is Texas has a budget surplus right now, most states don't, so it can be quite good for the state at times. And they cut that tax in half for enhanced oil recovery to inspire production of enhanced oil recovery. And then they cut that tax again, so it's a lower tax rate, a fourth of normal tax rate, if that enhanced oil recovery is done with anthropogenic, Texas-born CO2. Right now, we import our CO2 from natural CO2 wells in Colorado. So we take natural geologic formations that have trapped CO2 for millions of years. That's what gives us some confidence that geological sequestration works. We take it out of the ground, move it a few hundred miles in Texas and put it back in the ground. We have in Texas the greatest emissions of CO2 of any other state. So it's weird that we're emitting more CO2 than any other state and importing CO2 from Colorado and New Mexico. So with this tax incentive, maybe there'll be a market created where we have people who pay money for carbon and people who have carbon don't want it. Well, if you have people who have carbon don't want it, people who are willing to pay you for it, that's a market. We just need this tax incentive to get it going, actually, so that now they're reconsidering new projects. So the whole point of carbon enhanced oil recovery isn't that it will solve the carbon problem, but it sure gives us a lot of excuses to build the pipelines, get some practice, get the infrastructure going. You put the carbon in the ground, you bring the oil out, that oil emits the CO2 later on. So the carbon balance isn't so beneficial. Okay, but you might get a little more oil out of the ground. Yeah, that's right. Pamela, under, for CCS, under the best case scenario, how soon could we expect to be able to sequester one gigaton per year of carbon emissions? Yeah. <laughs> Easy question. Yeah. yeah, sorry, you're in the hot seat here. I apologize. Well, it really is a question of when, when can we get going. Um, things didn't look very promising with the cancellation of the Future Gen project, um, and really we're just at small scale at this point. So until we have um, the political support and the, the dollars behind these larger demonstration projects, we're not going to get down the road any further on achieving a gigaton reduction. 
Um, having said that, we have gotten started and, and we have um, made some fundamental knowledge gains um, with the smaller scale projects, um, but until we have uh, the funding and political support, we're not going to head down that road. Question for Randy. With the case that you just made, why is a carbon tax on the ASPO's um, peak oil mitigation strategy blueprint in progress? Uh, good question. No good answer. It's a good question. Uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here, no, here's the, the, for any of you, the, the sort of insurmountable paradox that has come up over the past couple of days, no matter what we would choose or be able to afford to do technically or monetarily about carbon emissions here, if you're still going in China without um, doing carbon sequestration, what is that? You know, what's the impact? Many in the U.S. point to China as the worst CO2 em emitter. The Chinese argue that since their policy of one child per family has been instituted, they have prevented 300 million possible people from emitting CO2 forever. Any comments? It's hard to say that uh, the U.S. will go to a one-child policy, but the, the, the Chinese and the U.S. negotiators on emissions arrive at different statistics. The U.S. arrives and says China emits more carbon than the U.S. per year, and uh, so China needs to clean up its act. China says our emissions are normalized over 1.2 billion people, yours are over 300 million people, so the per capita is quite different by a factor of many. And then they, they come with a different statistic, which is over history, the U.S. has produced about 30 percent of all the emissions. Europe's produced about 25 percent, and China's produced about 8 percent. And so this is a cumulative effect for carbon dioxide because it lasts for so many decades. And they say, why should we uh, care so much about our year-over-year -year emissions? It's the cumulative effect that matters most. In this 300 million metric tons that's been avoided by their policy, over cumulative effect is actually real. No, no one gives them uh, that benchmark or that credit. But if you look at their total emissions over time, it's substantially lower than the U.S., despite their exceeding us now on a year-over-year -year basis. I mean, the beauty of what's happening right now is that the climate problem that we were thinking of as global is really devolving to the problem of about 10 nations, I would argue, and the two leading ones, America and China. Uh, I, I think the challenge both nations are clearly going to face over the next 20 or 30 years is developing sustainable energy solutions driven by peak oil. And, uh, you know, whether we're successful in, or in that enterprise or not is anybody's guess. I, I think it's a really difficult uh, thing to to do, but um, you know, I, I think a lot of the ways we think about, have thought about climate are really counterproductive. If you think about the resources that have been spent on CCF studying and analyzing it, and you think about the federal resources that have been spent on preparing for peak oil, it's enough to make you pissed off. I mean, we we have 2,000 scientists doing serious navel gazing about climate change. I, I want to emphasize, I think climate change is an enormous problem, but I think we, we, peak oil is going to arrive with all the subtlety of a neutron bomb. And in my view, it's going to put climate change off the front page within 10 years. It's not that climate's not a problem, and emissions aren't a problem, but this is what we face. And as a final kind of linking... Oh. Just to wrap a, a kind of a statement question combined, several people in their comments have pointed out that the IPCC SRES scenarios were not actually made by the modelers, they were made by economists. And this really is an economic question and, and people are wondering what will it take to have the economists start incorporating the fossil fuel constraints within their models. And I think this is something that would, is important to the IEA, to the Policymakers, uh, I think this is a critical crux in the whole discussion. And uh, the question to the group was if they know of economists who are now starting to do this. I, I think there are economists who, are, for the most part, aren't considering this, but there are a few who popped up who recognize environmental constraints, not resource constraints. But that will start to tie in. So the notion of accepted you can't pollute and dump your waste in the atmosphere or the waters forever without hitting some limit. And that's starting to ripple over. Like you also can't just uh, exploit a finite resource forever. The market, the markets don't always produce it. So I think there are some economists who are coming back to this idea. It's actually a multi-century old idea that there are limits to growth. So I, I, I'm not confident that it's going to take foot though, right? <laughs>
I hate to have to wrap, but if we want to eat, and we've got a wonderful lunchtime speaker, Mike Boyd is going to talk about the future of the aviation We, we need you to do this as yeah. you leave. Put your gear, all your stuff on your chair. That They need the tables again. We'll begin lunch in 15 minutes in the room. Thanks. Okay. Meet Charlie by the pool. <laughs>